Settle in class, today we find divinity through stubbornness and devotion. The paladin is a durable combatant who can turn spell slots to raw damage when they hit. They're among the most stereotyped classes, sometimes for a good reason, but they can be incredibly fun to play, especially for new players. Today we'll cover how they work, what their different oaths look like, and some fun ideas for new ways to view them without mechanically changing a thing. You ready? Let's go! So usually I would start with telling you how they have the second highest HP and get all armor and weapons, but this time let's get the preconceptions out of the way. If there's one thing you know about paladins, it's probably their lawful stupid reputation. This comes from previous editions, where you weren't allowed to play a paladin unless you were an awful good, to the point that your god would remove your power if you repeatedly acted out of line, or disrespected authority, lied, used poison, or associated with people you knew were consistently offending your morals. If you have a great DM and group, the restriction could create phenomenal characters in roleplay. One of my favorite adventures had four of us trying to figure out how to operate within different alignment requirements, and dealing with the fallout when half of us willingly broke them for the cause. That said, most groups don't have that golden combination, especially with new players or teenagers hence the reputation. However, none of that is required in this edition, so don't worry about the stereotype. All of that flavor text might try to claim you're good, but without mechanical backing, their opinion can be ignored this time. Well, more easily ignored. Not like we let them always get in our way before. People would always get around it by just having low intelligence and letting the party trick them. And speaking of tricks, you get a surprising amount. At level 1, you get in Leon Hands, a pool of daily healing points. You can spend them as an action to heal anyone you touch for however much you want, as long as you have the points. For 5, you can even cure poison or disease. Incredibly handy for touching people up or keeping yourself on the front lines where you belong. I always recommend keeping a few of these in reserve to bring up someone unconscious. You also get Divine Sense. A few times a day, you can locate all Celestials, Fiends, and Undead within 60 feet. Pretty situational, but if your DM likes using shape-shifting and invisibility, it can be nice. Most abilities they have follow that same sort of design, either targeting one nearby creature or everyone in the area. Cleansing Touch at level 14 lets you touch someone and remove spell effects, and you'll be collecting abilities that do something to everyone within 10 feet, increased to 30 at level 18. Or Protection lets you and your allies add charisma to saving throws, courage makes them immune to fear, and you'll get another one at level 7 based on your subclass. The main time you get a power that breaks this mold is level 2, easily their best shared level. First you get a fighting style. Your options are a bonus to AC, reducing hits or damage on your ally, more damage on your melee weapon, gaining blind sight, or learning two cleric cantrips. I like the last one as it gives you spells you can always use, unlike the rest of your magic, because you also get magic. You pick a small number of spells off a tiny spell list, but you can change them every day and have 13 exclusive ones. I personally love Compelled Duel to force foes to bite you, but most of them are smite spells. Cast the spell as a bonus action to do more damage on your attacks, usually with an added effect like blinding them. If you just want raw power, however, turn to your third level 2 ability, Divine Smite. Burn a spell slot to add 2d8 radiant damage to an attack. You choose to do this after the attack lands, and it increases with your spells not burned. And yes, this can stack with a smite spell. Eventually, it never fully turns off, letting you add a d8 on every attack. The paladin doesn't get much magic, but when they need to, they can rip people apart. Now attentive viewers might notice that I never mentioned a level 20 capstone feature. That's because they're the only class that doesn't share their final ability. Most paladins end up with a minute long transformation, but not always, and they do different things. What transformation you get is determined by your oath, the fancy word for your subclass. Your oath is the source of your power, and your devotion to its tenets is what gives you divine strength, both in the general class-wide sense and specialized abilities at level 3, 7, 15, and 20. This is also the last holdover from previous editions, as your DM is advised to hold you to the those tenets. Not nearly as harshly as previous editions, but they are able to force you to abandon this class or switch your oath if you keep willfully breaking it or unrepentantly cross it. It's like a warlock with their patron if the contract actually mattered. So let's take a look at what paths you have to choose from. Ancients Paladins are your nature subclass, devoted to life in the world. Rekindle hope through mercy and kindness, defend love and beauty, keep laughter and song in your heart, and be a beacon of joy for all. To facilitate this, all subclasses start with bonus spell options and two channel divinity options. Channel divinity is a once per short rest ability. In the Ancients case, you can bind someone with spectral vines to restrain them, or force all Fey and Fiends within 30 feet to be turned. Not like spin around, they have to run as far away from you as they can, using their action and losing their reaction. It also breaks illusions and shapeshifting. For the extra spells, you get things like Ensnaring Strike, Misty Step, Plant Growth, it's mostly nature stuff. Your level 7 aura grants resistance to damage from spells, which is wonderful. At 15, you can cause a hit to drop you to 1 HP instead of 0 once per day, and can't be magically aged. I forgot there were things that could even still magically age you in this version. Anyway, but Finally, at level 20, you become the Elder Champion. It's supposed to be a once per day thing, but all recent subclasses have added the ability to recharge this for a 5th level spell slot. For 1 minute, you have 10 regeneration, enemies within 10 feet have disadvantage against your spells and channel, and you can choose to cast these spells as a bonus action instead of an action. That 10 healing around doesn't stop when unconscious, so nothing's ever gonna keep you down. It also gives you a nature aesthetic, like antlers or bark skin, or acquiring moss, consume- Wait a second, this is supposed to be the Green Knight Paladin who cares about life, not honor. It literally says 
says that they don't believe in the principle of courage, but the tenant says that you have to be a beacon of courage. Well, if they're not gonna play by the theme, then neither will we. Be a magical girl, dropping moonbeams and resisting spells through friendship. Your ancient words that terrify fiends are your transformation catchphrase. Be an alarmingly muscular artist trying to spread your work to the world. Painting ropes to bind, your walls to ward. And I mean you're satisfying your oath as long as you're making people happy and it fills your heart up with sunshine to see them smile, so be an extremely well-armored pole dancer. Though you could always lean more into that guardian of natural beauty. One of Goblin University's resident paladins as Dale of the Dell. A guardian whose grove was overtaken by ghost plant and became a green drinking dompier himself thanks to his bond with the forest. He still follows the tenets of the protector, but I feel like it's secretly because so many monsters are green. He scares me. And now ancients have an ability that's oddly anti fey but the Watcher Paladin wants all creatures from all other planes to go home. Bay, angels, demons, the army of people staring into our world right now, and every other time I talk about adventuring, how do you send them home when most of them are already home? Are you okay? Depends on if they like the video. Anyway, doesn't matter, Watchers are all about people keeping to themselves. Stay alert, be loyal to your friends and your duty, and do not trust gifts from fiends. Or Faye, I know that one's not on the list, but trust me. That whole staying alert thing flavors their spells. Things like alarm, see invisibility, counter spell, divination, and abjuration. Acquire knowledge and defend yourself from what you find. Your channel can give a few people advantage on all mental saving throws for a minute, which are some of the worst effects, so incredibly useful. And remember that turning Faye and fiends thing that the Oath of Ancients had? Same thing, but add in aberrations, celestials, and elementals. Your aura lets everyone add your proficiency to initiative, and at level 15 you can bully wizards. If anyone around you succeeds in intelligence, wisdom, or charisma saving throw, you can do 2d8 plus charisma to whoever made them make that check. If you break into a wizard's home and set off a ward, you can smite them from another plane of existence for daring to lock their front door. There's no range, it doesn't even say that you have to be on the same plane of existence. He might be dead and you just killed his imp self 500 years later. That is just petty. <laughs> anyway, your max level form is Mortal Bulwark. Drew side 120 feet, advantage to hit all those monster types you can turn, and every hit counts as a banished spell if they aren't native to this plane. Forget the ancient Elder Champion, this is the Old Man build. This is Get Off My Lawn Incarnate. This ultimate introvert draws godlike power from wanting people to go away, and its tenets are basically just be an adventurer. So have fun with why you're like this. Are you a farmer with a woodcutting axe and a holy book trying to send these devils back to hell? An introverted goth kid from a magical forest who learned to ward to keep things out of your room? Be the sort of person who gets wrapped up in a Lovecraftian plotline by knowing too much, and now you're paranoid and constantly gathering more info on these creatures. If you're ever wanting to be a paranormal investigator, this is it. Of course, if you don't want to harass creatures for existing, maybe redemption is more your speed. For them, violence is a weapon of last resort. Evil is learning in circumstance, so reach out to these creatures and convince them to change. Follow up with them, set them example for others to live by. And most importantly, if you've decided a creature is hopeless, execute without mercy or hesitation. All of your spells fall along this line. Things to calm or hold down your phone. Your divinity gives you plus 5 persuasion or hit an enemy with the force of their last attack in radiant damage. If the enemy wizard uses disintegrate, you can do the same right back. Who needs counter spell when you have counter smite? Trick question, you do, because you also have counter spell. Your aura lets you take the damage of an attack against an ally, and at level 15 you automatically heal whenever you're below half health and conscious. And of course, 20. The Emissary of Redemption. You resist all damage and deal half of it back to the attacker, except this isn't a 1 minute transformation. It's permanent until you attack someone, in which case it drops for that person. And reflecting damage doesn't count as an attack. If you're focused on taking hits and protecting allies and don't care too much about direct damage, this subclass is perfect for you. And I don't just mean as a paladin, this might be one of your favorite subclasses overall. Of course, this all assumes that you don't want to hurt people, but I gotta wonder why. Are you just too nice and don't want anyone getting hurt? Or do you think fighting's beneath you and everyone needs to learn their place? Are you flavored like a bard or jester, dancing and taunting while throwing beguiling spells? Cause that's be real here, holding someone down for your friends to beat up makes you just as much of a killer as the one who took the shot. There's a good chance that you're punishing them for defending themselves. Go full gas night on your enemy, I guess. Or just own up to it. Beating them down and talking is a valid strategy. Work for Naruto. Anyway, back to harassing things for existing in your line of sight. Devotion is the most bog standard paladin you can find. Honesty, courage, duty, honor, protecting the weak and those entrusted to you, obey those with authority over you, become the most romanticized knight possible, for that is the devotion paladin. They know spells like Beacon of Hope, Guardian of Faith, and Sanctuary. Their channel ability makes their weapon magical, glowing, and hit better. You can also channel to turn fiends and the undead. Your aura stops you from being charmed, your level 15 gives you a permanent protection from good and evil, and finally you get the Holy Nimbus. For one minute you praise the sun, which shines upon you in a large beam of light. Enemies within the bright light take 10 radiant damage around, and you get 
advantage on saves from spells cast by fiends and undead. I don't know what else to say, the flavor text calls them white knights and holy warriors. These and the next paladin are the most default crusader you can get. These are your shining knights and perfect paladins of old. Pick a god and pray, but they won't hear you over the charging pally yelling Dallas <laughs> yelling Dallas <laughs> yelling Deus Bolt. You probably already know what you want to play, because you can't turn around in fantasy without tripping over one of these. Therefore, my advice to you is to remember where you are. You're a tanky mage with big damage and healing and the power of god and enemy on your side. It's really easy to believe your own hype, but remember that there are others at this table. It's fine to get excited, great to love your character, you should do cool things and have fun. But try not to dominate every conversation, make every choice, and sign everyone up for every mission. You are a main character, not the main character. So don't hog all the screen time. And sorry if I've been getting preachy this episode, but we are talking about a punchity priest, and that goes double if you play Oath of Glory. Pretty simple, they believe that they and their friends are destined for glory and heroics. Glory through action, for challenges or tests to be overcome with jolly cooperation. So hone your body and overcome failure, rise again for victory. They learn spells like heroism and haste, with channel divinity into channeling athleticism. 10 minutes of improved athletics or acrobatics, lifting twice as much and jumping better. Or you can throw temporary HP at your friends when you land a smite. Your aura makes everyone move faster, and your level 15 is a parry. Bonus AC is a reaction, and if they miss, you can strike back. Eventually, you get Living Legend. Another one of those minute forms where you become the perfection you're hyped up to be. You get advantage on charisma checks, you can reroll a saving throw every round, and once per turn when you miss an attack, you can rewrite your legend to say you hit. And I love how it mentions that even at level 20, your legends might be exaggerated. Of course, the obvious angle is the bumbling but enthusiastic knight. From Don Quixote to Solaire, it's a tried and true knight for a reason. Maybe you're just a really nice gym bro, the kind that's really enthusiastic about helping everyone be the best they can be. Maybe you're a thrill seeker, an adrenaline junkie, or a hunter always after better prey. Come to think of it, what is the legend that you're seeking? Are you wanting to be known for liberation, or fighting, or helping others? Do you have a different reputation you're trying to overcome, like a dark past or previous failure? Maybe you have some sort of cool title you're trying to shake because of a secret embarrassing history. You're known as Burning Justice because you were serving tables and launched hot soup at a politician when you tripped. But you were covered in food and ripped your pants, and everyone knows it was an accident. This was mockery. Or maybe you're the beauty of the lake, because after a fight they found you passed out on a park bench with half your lunch strewn all over. Someone made a painting, it wasn't flattering, it, it, it's a whole thing. However, you can avoid that if the glory isn't for yourself. The crown is about the glories of civilization, law above all else except loyalty, which is above law and even oaths. That seems counterproductive as an oath. Courage, though. Doing what needs to be done and taking responsibility for your actions. Yes, civilization. Your channel can turn the tide and heal everyone around you, or stops your enemies from moving more than 30 feet away. Your spells are similar. Things like Compel Duel and Spirit Guardians and Aura of Vitality. Breaking the mold, however, you don't get an aura. Instead, you can take damage for adjacent creatures, for none shall be hurt on your watch. Level 15 gives you advantage against paralysis and stun, and eventually you become the Exalted Champion. You resist bludgeoning, period and slashing damage from non-magical weapons, and an aura of advantage on both wisdom and death saves. That's where your aura went. And to make up for lost time, it goes on for a full hour. Look at this hippopotamus. Oath of crown and queen and country? Yes, I- what has gotten into me with his voice? Look, I know some of the oath of crown stuff might look a little weak, but it's still a blast. One of my buddies was a fantastic triton one, with a fun fish out of water interplay of him learning that things are different on land and getting to make up packs from down below. Let your background and species take a leading role here. There's plenty of customization just comparing a paragon of goblin law to one of dwarven or elven law. Now throw in your background, because how does that affect you? Maybe you struggle to uphold the law with urchins because you were one. I know it's theft, but just let them have the bread. Or maybe you're an artist focused on punishing theft and plagiarism. You could take the archaeologist background to be an amateur historian who thinks the ancients had some great ideas and you're learning to resurrect them. Or you could ditch the whole cop theme and become the leader of a war band. After all, inspiration is the real theme of these abilities. Maybe you're the rare and mythical folk hero. Or you're just a decent shift lead. Same thing. No matter how you cut it, Crown is great at empowering and protecting your allies. You don't have to go full imperialist. That's the next one. Conquest paladins are all about subjugation. Mere order isn't enough. Apparently one of their biggest enemies is other conquest paladins who turn to hell because they're about law, not morality. This is apparently too far? Did the others not read their own tenets? Because they can just look down, they're burned into their flesh. Dow is the flame of hope so their will is shattered and they are left too terrified to disobey. Rule with an iron fist, your word is law and those who defy shall be made into an example. 
all. Strength above all. Might makes right and the strongest alone should rule. That seems pretty straightforward to me. I don't know why talking to a Marinith is suddenly way too far. Your spells are things like command, fear, and dominate person. Your channel can give you a plus 10 to hit or frighten enemies within 30 feet. And that's better than it sounds because your aura ability damages all frightened creatures and stops them from moving. At 15, you deal psychic damage to anything that hits you and your ultimate form gives you a transformation, the Invincible Conqueror. You resist all damage, make an extra attack, and crit on a 19 or 20. Good luck to anything opposing you. Conquest Paladins are perfect for pure evil. Now, some of the best adventurers I know have been evil, but it's one of those things where the player really has to know what they're doing and be acting in good faith or it's going to be bad for everyone. I completely understand just not wanting to mess with it. If someone's wanting to be evil, they really have to earn my trust first. Anyway, if general domination's not your thing, you can always try to be an overbearing parent who thinks they know best, or an ignorant noble who legitimately thinks that they're doing good thanks to how sheltered they were. Keep it small, be some crazed teenager trying to collect and display all the world like a pile of plushies. But honestly, the best way to make this not evil is to just change the tenets. Unless you're in Adventures League, most teams will be fine if you change them as long as they fit the theme. Instead of subjugation, lean into spreading fear and be a horror monster. Change your fear to sadness, you're just so depressed it spreads to your enemies like a plague, making them give up and run or just freeze and cry. I can't get the thought of Eeyore the Conqueror out of my head. It's inside out, but sadness is actually out and grabbed a claymore. <laughs> look, if you're wanting to go with the bad methods but actually a good person thing, maybe you should look at vengeance instead. Oh wow, they're literally called a dark knight. This is the vigilante paladin, the anti-hero. Fight your sworn foes without mercy by any means necessary. You'll prioritize the greater evil and help people recover when you fail to stop them, but this is the paladin that's dripping an edge. You get spells like Hunter's Mark and Banishment and nearly anything else a pally would want for killing. It's a loaded list. Whenever you channel, you can either frighten a foe or gain advantage on attacks against them for one minute. You don't get an aura since I guess you work alone or something, but instead you can move half your speed whenever you hit an attack of opportunity. You can't let your villain of the week get away after all. At level 15, your Soul of Vengeance lets you use your reaction on your turn for an extra attack, as long as they're under that advantage version of your channel divinity. And finally, you transform into the Avenging Angel. You grow wings and frighten things within 30 feet. You also have advantage when attacking frightened enemies. Obviously, this is the Paladin Vigilante. Even the book admits you might not be lawful. And if you want that, feel free. Running a superhero is great. There's hardly anything that more perfectly matches with I get my power for my drive and moral code, which is why I will now recommend taking that away. Traditionally, these oaths weren't just to yourself or the concept of existence. They were oaths made to a god like a contract. When you think about it, the Paladin was the first warlock. Bring that back. You made an oath to a devil to get your revenge. You gathered Eldritch power and your oath is just self-made rules to keep yourself from dwelling on your knowledge and going mad. You made an oath to Nemesis and she holds you to it if you want to continue channeling her power. And this works for any paladin, but I find it especially good for vengeance. Otherwise, I feel like we'd have legions of these things running around, hunting down every dragon and bandit. Eventually, the families of the villains would become them, and then the whole world would be nothing but a field of vengeance eating itself, which does make sense, but including a cost keeps things in check. Now, as much as other paladins fear vengeance or hate conquest, at least they still stick to the plan, one the universe seems to think is fine. Oathbreakers do not. These are in the DM guide because they're typically evil and meant to be a villain, but you can still use it with DM approval. Your spells are themed on hell, madness, pain, etc. Your channel can either frighten those around you or completely dominate an undead for 24 hours. At 15, you gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons, and at 20, you get a special 30-foot aura once per day. It reduces light, damages all frightened enemies, gives disadvantage on all foes who need to see, and can deal necrotic damage to an enemy as a bonus action. All of these options are pretty dang strong, and you've got a nice idea for a theme here. But here's the weird part. Your level 7 Aura of Hate gives extra damage to all undead and fiends. It doesn't let you choose, it's all of them, including the enemies, and you can't turn this off. I mean, it's a DM option, it wasn't really supposed to be an issue. But conceptually speaking, there's even more issues. The book says that you broke your oaths to pursue evil or dark ambition. The lights burning in your heart are finally extinguished. That's why your subclass features are replaced with these ones. But tenants make the paladin, and you don't have to have good ones. You've seen the conquest paladin. The books got rid of the lawful good requirement, then made you have distinct and usually good laws that can turn you into this if you break them too much. Yes, they'll have to be lawful because your laws are what give you power. And you might be thinking, oh, they're personal laws, but the Gold Dragon, Bone Devil, and Judge of All Cosmos are all lawful, but they are definitely not the same laws. The point is order, and you are literally drawing your power from self-imposed order, which makes it even weirder that this has none. Where is that power coming from? Look, the obvious customization question is why you broke the oath, I don't have to tell you that. So my question is what sustains your power in the aftermath? Is your own will so strong that it formed a spark of divinity, turned you into something like a demigod? Are you just so used to siphoning off otherworldly power that when heaven cast you out, you reflexively turn to hell? Maybe your spoken oath is just training wheels, and being true to yourself is what does it. I like to think of an oathbreaker as having that 
latched onto her power as it was stripped away, and the struggle twisted it into what it is now. Anyway, speaking on the Paladin as a whole, I think it's a really fun class, one of my favorites. It's powerful, flavorful, and for an experienced player, the Oath provides an interesting base to build around. Meanwhile, for a new player, it's one of the most friendly casters. Their spellcasting symbol can be changed at any time, and can be turned into smites if you don't like your options. They're tough enough to handle any mistake you made, their abilities are usually pretty simple, and just existing on the front lines is already a good help. If you're wanting to lean more into magic, you can always try the Cleric, or try the Ranger or Fighter for a similar feel with a different theme. That theme is both their strength and their weakness. They're intertwined with an alignment system that 5e has pretty much removed. Yeah, they talk about it a lot, but they ripped it out of everything. Even protection from good and evil just cares about your creature type, not your alignment. I like alignment, but even I think they should have grown a backbone and put it out of everyone's misery. Pick a lane. It is bizarre that a cleric can be removed from their alignment and gone, but not the paladin, because effectively it is still stuck with alignment, just using worse words. But to be fair, it did kind of have to be. A paladin without a code is like a mage without magic or a vertebrate without a spine. You might be something cool, but you aren't that because those words have meaning. I think it's really cool that the class has a narrative aspect, and the point of the paladin is to strive towards an ideal. You might stumble, you're not perfect, but the drive towards that ideal gives you power. It's like a better narrative counterpart to the wizard's spellbook. Your words are just written in your heart. The shattering of your belief being the equivalent of burning your spellbook just makes sense. Because of that, my advice is that the DM and the player should work out their own core tenets for the character they have in mind. Feel free to reflavor your subclass, but make sure it fits with the oath you build. As long as they're striving towards those goals, they're a paladin. If they start faltering, they have visions or dreams or messengers of a god, warning them that they are falling with increasing desperation. They feel in their soul that their power is slipping. Given that chance, the player might change and repent, or they could swear a new set of oaths, fitting who they are now. If they go that route, make them go through a trial to prove their devotion. Or they could lose their blessing, twisting into an oathbreaker should they refuse to return the power. And if you don't want to play with any of that, just remove the whole oath thing altogether. There's not really much of a point if it doesn't have teeth. It's like a cleric's god or a warlock patron. Make them matter or why bother? Wait, hold up. I forgot to mention. Level 3, all paladins are immune to disease. I've seen people get disease twice in over a decade, and that was in Pathfinder, and I caused it. Contagion, my love, we lost you in the addition change. Nothing will fill the hole in my heart. You will be missed. Because you are gone, unlike my coffee supporters who are by my side helping me buy things for the show. Barrel Goblin and Modern Masquerade, thank you so much as always for the support of my coffee. And hey, if you stopped or you couldn't begin with or you just didn't want to perfectly valid, I still remember and appreciate you. And as much as I do love it when you like and comment and sub, it really is worth it just to know that you watched. Anyway, I am definitely rambling. All together, people, happy, happy holidays. holidays! Class dismissed!